Bom, é um grande prazer e uma honra para mim apresentar o professor Neil Trudinger da Universidade Nacional da Austrália e vou fazer alguns comentários muito curtos sobre sua biografia. Ele é australiano e é a primeira vez que visita a América do Sul, em particular o Brasil. Fez seus estudos de segundo grau na Austrália e depois viajou para, para os Estados Unidos para trabalhar em seu doutorado em Stanford sob a orientação do David Gilbert. Então temos aqui dois nomes, Gilbert e Trudinger, que os, qualquer um que tenha estudado equações diferenciais parciais ou geometria diferencial relacionada com equações diferenciais parciais conhece muito bem. Então ele terminou seu doutorado há 40 anos e dez anos mais tarde publicou a famosa eh, monografia né? Elliptic, Differ eh, Elliptic Differential Equations at Second Order, do qual existem novas edições e hoje considerada uma obra definitiva sobre o assunto e um clássico da literatura do tema. Ele tem aproximadamente 100 trabalhos publicados de pesquisa, com mais de 3.500 citações realizadas por 2.700 pesquisadores que o referem em suas bibliografias dos trabalhos que publicaram. Ganhou alguns prêmios, como a medalha Hanan otorgada pela Academia Australiana de Ciências e o prêmio do Instituto Henrique Pancarré Gauthier Villar. Ele tem trabalhado em vários assuntos de, das equações diferenciais parciais não lineares, tanto das técnicas quanto das aplicações a outras áreas da matemática. E, em particular, tem trabalhado em desigualdades a priori, como a desigualdade de Hanak, desigualdades de tipo geométrico, como desigualdades de isoperimétricas. Tem trabalhado no problema de Dirichlet para problemas para equações elípticas puramente não lineares. Em particular, complementou a série de três trabalhos de Cafaria Linear em Blesbrook para situações que não tinham sido contempladas os assuntos que interessam muito aos, aos geômetras e os interessados em, na teoria de EDP. Também trabalhou em regularidade, trabalhou com operadores elípticos com coeficientes com regularidade mínima, com apenas mensuráveis. E... Deixa, bom, a equação esse ano, particularmente, eu acho que lembrei de muitas das coisas que ele fez, ele resolveu algumas conjecturas, uma conjectura proposta por Chern e recentemente fez contribuições fundamentais para a resolução em dimensão 2 da, do problema de monge de transporte de massa, que é um problema que tem 200 anos de idade. E hoje ele vai falar sobre é, transporte ótimo, o que ele vai explicar em sua palestra. Ok, now switching to English. It's a pleasure to introduce Professor Trudinger, who will talk on optimal transportation and partial differential equations. Right. So thank you very much, Professor Huni, and also Professor Soros and organizing committee for this uh, invitation. Uh, I'm a person of the Southern Hemisphere, and that's where I I prefer to be, but this is the first time I've been to South America, and it's a great, uh, great fun to be here. 
So this talk is about recent work. It, it concerns the interaction uh, with nonlinear PDE and optimal transportation. Um, okay, that's uh, that's uh, an, an upper 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 bound for the <laughs> contents of the talk. Um, and so let me just start with the, the basic uh, transport problem. This is also known as the problem of mass uh, transfer, and I've simplified things a little bit. My, my concern here is, is to have um, solutions determined by PDE, and so we're not going to necessarily put the, frame the problem as a, a problem about measures straight away. So what, what we start with is domains. Um, One's our initial domain, the other one is a target domain. And for, for my talk, these will be in Rn, but it's best to think of them each in its own copy of Rn. And uh, or we can talk about uh, mappings uh, between Riemannian manifolds. So this notion of transport or mass transfer is not the right notion. It's not really, you can't really think of points in the same space being moved. That's just one special situation. So we're given, and we're given We'll take two densities, just non-negative functions, in L1, uh, and they satisfy a mass balance condition. The integral of f is the same as the integral of g. And we have a notion uh, given various names, sometimes measure preserving. I'll just call this mass preserving. Apply the notion to densities. It's simply, and, and it can say it. As we can express it by saying that this mapping t pushes forward. Uh, the measure of density f to the measure of density g, or it's a, a local a local preservation of of mass with respect to these densities f and g. So such mappings we'll call mass preserving. So we, we have a domain, we have our densities, and we have this family of uh, mappings. And this is the uh, okay. I'm given another important thing as a cost function. So it's a function on the product of the two domains, just to con say a continuous function. And you can think of the cost function as the cost of, of moving from a point, a point in omega to a point in omega star. And then we can define a functional, um, which now is the overall cost of transporting the density f to the density g. And this monge kontorovich problem now is simply to minimize C over this uh, set of measure preserving mappings T. So it's a quite a, a simple problem to formulate. Uh, it's a, typically at this stage in talks people picture some material being moved from one place to another so this is God making uh, sugar loaf. Um, okay so now let me just mentioned the two sort of fundamental examples. They're not the, the right example for, um, for this talk. The, 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 the key to the um, regularity theory and really, really came from a different problem, the, the problem of, of light reflection. But these are the two fundamental examples. One is if we just suppose that the, we're moving from points X to points Y in, in Rn and, 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 and uh, the cost is just the work done. It's proportional for distance moved. This is the original Monge problem, uh, and it was a famous problem in the 19th century. There was a, a kind of some formal analysis by Apple, who, who uh, was given a prize by the Academy de Paris. Uh, some very important work by Kantorovich uh, in the middle of the last century, uh, and uh, that work was linked to the foundations of linear programming. A very formidable paper by Sudikov in 1979, a probability theorist who uh, claimed to uh, solve this, the problem. A uh, PD approach uh, using uh, P Laplace in as P goes to infinity by Evans Gungbo. And then not so long ago, there were a couple of new proofs, one by myself and a colleague, Suja Wang, uh, and, an, an, and an independent work by Caffarelli, Fellman, and McCann. So at first, we just thought these were new proofs. And then subsequently, a uh, mistake was found in the uh, Sudikov paper, which restricted it to two dimensions. So in some sense, the, the, the job wasn't done until the uh, beginning of this century. 
the sad thing about that is we don't get any prizes. <laughs> And almost no, these two papers have all, at the bottom there have almost no citations. <laughs> it's rather strange. And then it's the quadratic cost, which is the main cost that's been used in applications. Um, in the first case, one has some existence, has an existence result. There's no regularity, no uniqueness. Uh, we call that a bad cost. And and this is, uh, we will see, but this is a, not a perfect cost, but not too bad. This quadratic cost. Um, so there's an existence uniqueness result in the wake of Katorovich's work, uh, two statisticians, not in Smith, and then subsequently Brenier, and it was Brenier who really uh, was, was the um, cause of the rebirth of this whole subject after his work. Uh, and so regularity results, so that, you know, under certain con geometric conditions, the solutions are, are smooth by Caffarelli and uh, Urbis. And let me advertise a, a modern reference. This is by Cedric Vellani. Uh, there's a new book by Vellani going to appear soon, but this is this is quite a good reference, and it's some of it's in the spirit of the of the of the talk as well. Okay, so now I want to go back to the 19th century, and this was not done at the time, but it could have been done, and um, it's because people were focused on the on the sort of so-called bad cost, uh, monge cost. Let's um, just regard this as a problem in the calculus of variations. Okay, that constraint is simply a PDE uh, in, in, in a system of for a system of functions. It just uh, prescribes the determinant of the Jacobian mapping. So let's just uh, suppose we go back and we simply take the constraint, take the functional, and apply a, a Lagrange multiplier method and see what what that what that does. Um, Okay, we can do that. We add on a, so this is a uh, pointwise constraint. So we add on a, a Lagrange multiplier is now a function, add it on to something which is equivalent to the constraint, and just take the Euler Lagrange equation. Okay, so these are the calculations. I'm using the upper indices for the cofactor of the, of the matrix dt. Of course, if I've got a smooth diffeomorphism, I can assume that the determinant has a positive or negative sign and just take out the absolute value, uh, just take the positive sign. Um, and what we do is we just calculate, and we find uh, very quickly that, that the mapping t is given by an equation of this form. The y derivative of, of the cost at x t of x is going to be the gradient of a function psi defined on the domain, on the target domain. Then we call that function a potential. Uh, in fact, if we switch then omega and omega star around, this is the usual, the, 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 the first potential. and we def and we have a way, that, so we, we end up with this function phi, which is a scalar function, and the function phi is related uh, to the optimal mapping by such a, uh, uh, an equation. So potentials were kind of there uh, for the taking a long time ago. Um, so both these functions are called potentials. They're dual to each other, and you can realize them through this uh, equation. I could keep going. I could actually go ahead and look for conditions under which this equation is, is optimizes the, the corresponding inequality. I could keep going, and I could actually could develop the theory from this, this point. Um, but what I want to do is uh, so okay. So we'll just just so that if these if we assume that these two mappings are invertible uh, for the other variable each, and um, then we can recover the mapping from these uh, potentials. And this distinguishes the Monge cost straight away. You cannot do this with a Monge cost. The best you'll get from this approach is the Iconal equation for a potential. OK, so now, how can we find potentials? Well, this is the contribution of Kontorovich. Um, and this is a, a dual of a, of a relaxed linear problem uh, that Kontorovich formulated. We want to maximize this particular functional over such a set. You can see we've almost reached that set in the Lagrange multiplier argument. Um, okay, so let's. Uh, this is easy to solve um, with the right, uh, reasonable conditions. So one thing you can check straight away that this this Kantorovich functional is always less than or equal to the cost functional on the respective sets. It's just using the mass-preserving condition. So you want to 
uh, produce a maximum of the, of the J, which at the same time is a minimum of the C. You want to produce equality there. And OK, we can apply direct calculus of variations method. Um, if you have a, mini a minimizing sequence, you can re replace the functions by uh, generalization of Legendre transforms with respect to the C function. That gives them some smoothness, gives them Lipschitz, Lipschitz smoothness. And then, of course, you can extract the subsequences, and it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward to uh, produce a pair that, that optimizes the functional. And, and this pair will be such that they're self-dual. Each one is the corresponding C transform of the other. And then to recover the optimal mapping from the Kantorovich potential under the assumption that I could solve that equation, C sub x, x, y equals something or other, then we can just construct a T. And then following the theory, we need to prove some things. T is well defined almost everywhere. T is mass preserving. That's a little argument. We have the equality, so T is optimal. T is going to be unique. AE on the uh, <coughs> set where density is positive. And if I define uh, the, the T star, which is the reverse coming back from the omega star, then T star composed with T and T composed with T star is the identity. So this sort of solves the problem, but not in a smooth sense, in the sense that these are potentials. And these potentials are such that they would be Lipschitz and they'd be semi semi-concave, so they're going to be twice differentiable almost everywhere. Okay, a bit of historical stuff. This is, this is the process carried out by Knott and Smith, and then it extends without much trouble to more general cases. Okay, so these, and, and, and these potentials we find have these properties. They're twice differentiable almost everywhere. Uh, they're going to be C concave in the following sense that um, if I look at these um, cost functions uh, and at, at, at fixed values, say, of the uh, second variable plus constants, we can call these sort of C functions. They play the role of um, affine functions in, in convexity theory. And we have notions of conv concavity and convexity with respect to such functions. In fact, there's a whole theory developed now for this type of convexity. And our potential that we find this way is C concave. So you can think of it this way. Here's the, here's the graph. And at each point, we have a, one of these C functions. Oh, other way around, sorry. It's, this is concave. So there's our phi, and sitting here are one of these uh, C functions. And contacting at one point or at least one point. OK, now what I want to do is, I'm, I'm, from the minimizing problem, without any minus signs, I'm ending up with con an, a general, an extension of concave functions. And if I head towards mont Ampere signs, I'm going to multiply the determinant by minus 1 and so on, which I hate doing, uh, although most people multiply Laplacian by minus 1. But in mont Ampere equation, you don't want to multiply the determinant. Of the, by, by, of the Hessian by minus 1. So I'll make a quick change. Let's just replace the potential by its negative. And then the C concave becomes a kind of convexity with respect to the negative of C. I'll just call that C minus uh, convex because I don't know any better way of, of doing that. I don't, and there's a lot of confusion, of course, because people would just call that C convex. But the intersection then of C convex and C concave are not the C functions. Um, and then we, 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 the dual notion we'll, call, we'll just call C star concave. So on the, on the target domain, we just switch x and y, and, and we'll call that function C star. OK, so from this relation here, you, you see straight away that, uh, um, that we have this inequality almost everywhere that the, the Hessian of this phi is less than or equal to the Hessian with respect to the x variables of the c uh, at, on, the, on the mapping. And then if I switch to the function u, I have this positivity, uh, non-negativity. So we have a, a kind of um, analog already of, of, of local convexity. Second derivative is greater than or equal to 0. And I can also introduce a, uh, an extension of this Alexandrov notion of normal mapping. The, um, the set of 
of um, points y giving such a contact here is, co is kind of is called a c-normal image. So the singularity that's uh, multi-valued um, and it certainly uh, it, it sits in the regular subdifferential, uh, but at this stage we can't assert it that it corresponds to the whole subdifferential, as in the case of <coughs> convex functions. Okay, so now what's the equation? I've got potentials. They, these potentials actually solve the the problem. Um, what, what's, where's the PDE? Well, I could have gone back to Lagrange multipliers already and produced this equation, but let's suppose these are positive and this determinant uh, is positive. And now let's just write the um, mass preserving condition out uh, almost everywhere and then calculate this determinant. And then use this C minus convexity, which tells me that this d to u plus dx squared is greater than or equal to zero almost everywhere. And then we finally get our equation. So this is the optimal transportation equation. Uh, and it's a Monjam pair type equation. So take the determinant, the Hessian matrix of a function. We add on this function, uh, it's the Hessian with respect to the x derivatives of the cost function. And then the second term is evaluated on this mapping y, which is the, solving the relationship cx, c sub x of x of y equals du. So this y is a function of x and du. So that's the optimal transportation equation. It's a mont ampere equation simply of the form Hessian plus matrix function of independent variable and gradient equals, on the right hand side, that's just going to be a function of independent variable and the gradient. And we can go backwards. If we have a C2 solution and this mapping Y, which defines our T mapping, is onto omega star and U is C minus <coughs> convex, then this is in fact the optimal mapping for the Monge problem. We can actually plug that in and check that without going through the Kantorovich existence theory. So that's the equation that I want to talk about. Uh, I finished the PD of Monge ampere type. Uh, this convexity condition tells me that the, the solutions in, that I want to, to look for will be the elliptic solutions if, the, if those densities are positive and the general elliptic if I, have, if I allow zero densities. So the problem reduces to elliptic solutions of Monjam pair equations. If I can find these and then I can solve the transport uh, problem. Um, but I have to do more than just find an elliptic solution. I've got to find an elliptic solution which has this global C convexity property. That's not necessarily, that's perhaps a stronger condition than uh, ellipticity in the same way that uh, local convexity implies convexity on a convex set only that one would have to take the elliptic solution and somehow show it has the global property. Okay, so this is a special case of an arbitrary equation. Let's suppose we do this at the vector field level. Simply uh, look at the equation where we prescribe the determinant of the Jacobian of the vector field. Uh, so the, the optimal transportation case is a special case of, of that type of equation. It doesn't necessarily come from a cost function. And even, even worse, that in this case, the matrix sitting up in the, under the determinant may not be symmetric. I should use this really. I'm not, not used to all this technology. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. So those are those are those are three three interesting equations at three levels: the matrix level, the vector field level, and the uh, cost function level. Okay. So what about finding smooth solutions or solving the transport problem with? Uh, smooth solutions. So what was uh, known some years ago was the quadratic case, the, the case where the cost function is the distance squared. And these are the results of Caffarelli and, and Urbis. Uh, 
take uniformly convex domains, and suppose the densities are smooth, we just make everything as smooth as we wish, then there are unique optimal diffeomorphisms, and they're given by identity plus a gradient of a convex function, and that convex function satisfies this uh, Monge Ampere uh, equation. Actually, it's not completely, don't worry, it's not written exactly the way it should be. Um, satisfies <laughs> this uh, Monge Ampere uh, uh, equation. And we also have local regularity. If I only assume these, these target, these domains are convex, then you have local regularity. That was an early result of uh, Caffarelli. This I shouldn't be there. <laughs> okay, so so this um, was what was, was the extent of knowledge about regularity about 10 years ago. And uh, we can ask the general question now. And the general question is, is for what cost functions and domains are there solutions which are smooth diffeomorphisms for smooth positive densities? So that's the general question. Uh, here's some uh, propaganda from uh, Propaganda from Villani's book. Uh, I don't know if he'd say the same thing now, but he said it before. Uh, without any doubt, the uh, main open problem is to derive regularity estimates for more general transportation costs. At the moment, essentially nothing is is known about solution about solutions except those things like uh, twice differential, but almost everywhere ellipses which come from C concavity. So this is this is the this was the a problem. And what I want to talk about now is, is, is essentially the solution of this problem. Not the complete solution, because always you'll solve something, but then there's some, some small things arise which probably need to be addressed to get a complete solution. But I'll, what I'll do is I'll present conditions uh, and, uh, and domain conditions which are essentially sharp, uh, which um, ensure that you can solve this problem with, in, the, in the class of smooth diffeomorphisms. So let me describe these uh, conditions. Um, at first sight, they don't look very attractive. We now know from other work that they're very natural conditions. They have nice geometric interpretations. Uh, at least all these conditions will be invariant conditions uh, to begin with, which the mont equation itself is not. Uh, so that's one thing. We're looking for diffeomorphisms. We should at least make sure our conditions are invariant under diffeomorphisms, and they have that property. So they, for that reason, they also look natural, but they not really, there wasn't that much agreement some years ago that they were natural. Uh, so let me describe the conditions on the cost functions. So this first condition, this is this non-degenerate condition. That what, What's important here is not, the, is not that we can find for any P and Q, but these mappings from the P and the Q to the, to the capital X's and the capital Y's are injective. We can look at situations where the images of these gradients are not all of Rn. Okay, so that's a, a condition. The second condition is that we can do this smoothly. So we assume that this determinant is banner from below the absolute value of the, of the mixed xy derivative is banner from below. So these are, these are just the conditions to proceed smoothly from the potential to the mapping. Nothing more than that. OK, here's the, here's the, the nastier condition. It's not written in the most nasty way. I want to take this matrix. Uh, so this is our matrix sitting in the mont equation. I'm writing it as a function of x and, and p. Uh, but it's, it could be written as a function of x and, and y. Uh, and I want to assume that this is regular in the sense that if I take the negative of two p derivatives, um, then this form is, is non-negative over vectors which are orthogonal. So that's the condition. It's a kind of convexity type condition with respect to the gradient variables, but it's very important to, to have this orthogonality you can look at that, you might think, well, these are looking like sectional curvatures. And in fact, that's perfectly true. These, these can be interpreted as, as sectional curvatures. 
Uh, um, and that's, that's the weak condition. This is condition satisfied by the quadratic cost. The quadratic cost is totally degenerate with respect to this condition. That's why I said it's not perfect. It's, it's a degenerate example. Uh, and the strong condition is the following, that we assume there's a lower bound. Right, well, so what does, the, what does that mean? We'll talk a bit about what, what the examples are in a, in, a, in a minute. And just make a remark that it's not completely obvious from the way I formulated it, but these are, in fact, symmetric conditions in X and Y. And it's, it's quite easy to see that these are invariant under, under separate coordinate changes in X and Y with the other one held fixed. Okay, so just keep in mind that there are these conditions. Where they are fourth order conditions on the costs. Uh, involve fourth derivatives of the cost. I've written them as second, as second derivatives uh, of this matrix, but remember this, this matrix is constructed from second derivatives, again, of the, of the cost function. What about the domains? Oh, sorry. I'm going to go. Uh, uh, let me now just. So, okay, this may look like horrible conditions. Let me write down some of the examples we, we, we found. Uh, so first thing to do is check the P costs, check all the powers. Um, there was a kind of feeling that uh, after the case P equals two, P between one and infinity should be, should be nice. Well, this is not true at all. Uh, if we check all the P's for the, uh, if I leave a positive sign there, the only reasonable guy for that condition is the quadratic case, which is only gonna satisfy the weak condition. But if I take the negatives, of these powers, which means for negative m, there's still the positives again, then I find a, a gap between minus two and one, where these are regular, what we call what I call regular, uh, in this gap, and we can, and they're strictly regular if I stay away from minus two. So the closest cost, new cost here to the quadratic one is actually it's reciprocal. People would think it might be a log or something. And the negative log fits very nicely here. That's the case m equals zero. We have a, and we take the minus sign, we have a negative log. The negative log was the one uh, that already came up in this light reflection. It was a restriction to the sphere of the negative log of the distance in, uh, in the ambient Euclidean space. And I can actually write the vector field out. It's kind of reminiscent of P Laplaceans. Okay, here's an example that came from the work of Jan Brenier in, in relativistic uh, optimal transportation. It's the square root of one plus x minus y squared. Uh, that's the matrix you get. And you can check that this one is a, it's quite a good cost. It's strictly regular. Uh, that's the vector field. And you can look at that vector field and you look at the matrix and you'll see that this is, this is kind of similar to an equation that comes up with prescribed Lorentzian curvature equation, which is not surprising given its origin in relativity. Uh, I should jump back because this one is kind of tantalizing. You'd like to put a, replace the one by an epsilon squared and send the epsilon squared to zero. What happens? Some strange things happen. It turns out that if you want things to work, your domains actually lose it, collapse into the boundary of a sphere. You can't, you can't make that approximation when, from, the, from that one. Um, Is, this is the, looks a bit strange because this is the negative of the genre transform of the previous example. And this one is, is nice. And then you see, um, if you look at that matrix A, then you see it's um, the, um, the, the eigenvalues of the Hessian with respect to the negative of that matrix are just the principal curvatures of the graph. That's a nice cost. Uh, and this is when I, we sort of looked at to try to get a feeling what might happen on manifolds. We took graphs and took the distance squared between two, two graphs. And we found that if these functions determining the graphs were convex, we needed the condition that the gradient was less than one, or at least um, some inner product was less than one. Uh, that if th these functions are convex, then it's uh, regular. And if it satisfies the strict condition, if they're uniformly convex. And some examples of functions would be the following. 
uh, the, so distances in a hyperboloid will be uh, nice. Uh, this is a portion of a sphere. It gave us some idea what might happen on a sphere uh, with quadratic costs, uh, but the restrictions of Euclidean costs on the sphere. And, um, and this is a nice one for approximating the, the quadratic cost. It's a, it's a strictly regular one, but as epsilon goes to zero, it's, it's, it's approaching the quadratic cost. Okay, so what about domains? Uh, I need, an, I need a, a notion of convexity with respect to cost functions for domains. And this is the notion we came up with, that we say that a domain is C convex with respect to a target domain if all these images of the, of, of the Y gradient are convex. So in the case of a quadratic cost, which is equivalent to taking C uh, equal to X dot Y, this is just saying that the domain is, itself is convex. But now we have to say it's convex with respect to all these images. Um, that's a convexity condition. And then you can talk about being uniformly C convex means that all these images are uniformly convex with respect to that, with respect to a mega star, all points in a mega star. And, and this is an analytic formulation, which is the, in practice you have to work with this sort of thing for calculations. Uh, just pull back, pull back uh, from these images and you can write this as a condition on the, uh, essentially the curvatures of the boundary are this way and take the gradient for normal, but the curvatures of the boundary are with lower order terms. So that's an analytic formulation of the condition if a domain is connected. And then you get the same conditions for target domains. Uh, so this is the usual convex in quadratic case. Sufficiently small balls are also uniformly convex. If you want to go to large sets, then in that example about distances between graphs, the sub-level sets of, that, of the function f, for example, will be C convex. Um, and one thing about the analytic formulation is that that term I wrote there is actually equivalent to taking the, 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 the gradient, the derivative with respect to the gradients of this matrix. So that co it's connected to the linearized equation. So this is a condition that connects to the linearized e equation even though it's a convexity condition. And that actually helps in, in making estimates. Uh, and these are also invariant under coordinate changes. It's the right way to think of convexity as well. If you take the function it, x dot y, now replace that by uh, you know in a product of of um, two uh, two mappings, then this this convexity notion is preserved. Okay, let me jump back. Uh, right, um, let me just comment how these conditions arose. This C convexity condition uh, arose. Uh, it, it was. It arose from a, from, a, from a, the fact that, in, for any function, the um, say Lipschitz function, the, the, the local subdifferential is always a convex set. And it was a condition then that somehow applied to the target, kept the mapping inside the closure of the target. So the condition came from that. And it was later on that we uh, we found how to to quantify this condition, and it turned out to be the right uh, condition for, for estimates as well. Um, so here's a, a theorem on full global regularity. This one probably can't be improved. It's uh, by myself and my colleague, Suja Wang. Uh, let's say so smooth cost function, positive, smooth densities, everything, smooth domains. And those domains are uniformly C and C star convex with respect to each other. Then there's a globally smooth uh, diffeomorphism which solves the uh, mass transportation problem. And this is given now as the as this vector field y, uh, function of the gradient, and the u satisfies the optimal transportation equation with respect to what we call the second boundary condition. This is that you have you prescribe the image under the mapping T to be about the main omega star. Yeah. And you can reduce the regularity down a bit. If the, the cost need only be C4, say, or C31, C11 densities, and you can reduce down, you get a solution mappings which are C2 alpha.
Okay, and now we also prove with uh, Xinan Ma, uh, China, um, an interior result. I wrote, I wrote this in two years because it was the paper was published in 2005, but we only made a correction uh, late last year uh, um, to this uh, to the proof. Um, and here we, we just take our target domain to be C star convex, density smooth, everything else smooth, and we find the optimal mapping is smooth the interior. So this is a this is potentially a bad situation. We don't necessarily have a diffeomorphism. We could have a some crazy domain at the outset. That means our mapping will not be, it may be smooth, but it won't be onto omega star. And we still get, but we get a smooth mapping. And we can also reduce things down a bit. Uh, and okay, so this is, this is, this is very interesting. Uh, following our work, here's, a, here's a Gregoire Lopère uh, uh, made the following uh, extension that what if you drop the smoothness of the domains and by the way, the important thing here, of course, is this strong condition is satisfied, this A3 condition. This, this, these results are not, are not including the quadratic case. This is, and particularly this one. This one is simply not true for the quadratic case. That if you only assume some LP condition and, and, and possibly the F vanishing, then in fact you, uh, you find potential C1 alpha and the upper mapping is uh, C0 alpha. So as a consequence of Lopez's result, for example, if you just have some weak conditions on the, on the densities, uh, you'll, you may not get diffeomorphisms, but you'll get uh, homeomorphisms if the two domains are C and C star convex. This, is also, an, an ex a, 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 this also shows that that A3 strong condition is extremely strong. Okay, and now we go a bit further. What if A3W is violated? Then we have another nice uh, result by Gregoire Lopère that you'll find densities for which you um, cannot solve the optimal transportation problem with a continuous mapping. So from the point of view of the conditions on the cost functions, that global regularity result is sharp. Can't be improved <coughs> with respect to the cost function conditions. And we can go a bit further. Uh, in our original paper with Ma, we also showed that if you violate the C star convex of omega star, then again you'll find smooth densities, which um, problems not solvable for smooth mappings. This was already done in with non-convex domains, the quadratic case uh, before. So that um, global result is kind of sharp. The the local one, the extent to which you can extend the local result to this condition the weak A3 condition, the weak condition on the fourth order involving the fourth order form is not clear yet. It's, it extends to all the examples, but it's not clear if there will be a, a condition which, uh, which uh, ensures that it extends. I don't think it will extend to all of the degenerate ones. Okay, let me just jump to the, the manifold case. Uh, two types of costs. We have those costs which are just um, restrictions of costs in an ambient, so Euclidean space. Um, okay, and the main example here is this light reflector problem, and it's a restriction of this negative logarithm of the distance. And the Monge Ampere equation is that. Uh, and this one is very nice, extremely nice, it's strictly regular. And some regularity for this had been worked out earlier by, by Su Ju Wang. So this was kind of, this was the model problem for, for these results, really. And, and it was worked out before we knew it was a transport problem just from the Monge Ampere equation. That equation like that also comes up in conformal geometry as well. And this is the, the first part. And then, okay, now the, there's also this quadratic cost. This is a bad, a smooth cost on a compact manifold is extremely bad, of course, because the gradient's bounded. You're not gonna get that unique uh, inversion of these gradients. Uh, but this is fine if, you, if you, the points in X and Y don't go too far from each other and you can represent it as a graph. <laughs> okay, what about the intrinsic cost? Well, this is the interesting one. Uh, we can look at the geodesic distance squared. Now that those conditions are now going to be uh, fourth order 
conditions on the metric. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, four forty conditions on the metric, and no one really knows what that means yet. Uh, what we have is that this result of Lopaire that if we have this weak condition, then the sectional curvatures must be non-negative, which shows that there's no, uh, you wouldn't have this type of regularity in the hyperbolic manifolds. And Gregoire Lopaire also showed that we have strict regularity in the case of the sphere. That's about all that's known. How to go from the sphere to um, to um, other domains with positive sectional curvature and so on. We just don't know the answers to that. Uh, um, okay, I'll talk a bit about the proofs. I can't talk too much about the proofs. The proofs are old classical PDE. So this haven't said much PDE in this talk, but really when you do these things, it's all a priori estimates and uh, barrier arguments, differentiating <laughs> equations, controlling second derivatives. It's all PDE. So the, the global, but the proofs have different styles. For global regularity, we simply go at the, at the classical problem, find the, the solutions by um, a priori estimates, uh, method of continuity, have to show their C convex. That does bring in some general sort of convexity theory. And the most important uh, estimate in this whole business is, is that these turn out to be oblique boundary conditions. And the important thing is to control the obliqueness. And so those convexity conditions are used to control uh, the obliqueness of the boundary condition. But what about the different situation for interior regularity? Uh, here one takes the Kantorovich solution, the solution which is the potential, the bad solution. Then you try to take a small ball and patch in a good solution in the small and show they agree. Uh, so, so you um, solve a, a Dirichlet problem this time. Uh, in a small ball, approximating all the densities and boundary data uh, being given by the potential. And then we use interior estimates uh, and a very delicate comparison argument. That was the thing that had to be corrected later. And you also use the adaptation of the old theory of uh, Alexandrov and Backelman from Mont Ampere about weak solutions, generalized solutions. They're the same as the solutions of the transport problem in the case that the measures have, have densities. Okay. Oh. And let me just run through these estimates. Uh, so this is the obliqueness estimate. It, it's it's uh, you. You only need the domains to be. So, okay. Really, in, this is these estimates are the core of the problem. I mean, uh, you can give talks on things like optimal transportation. Fine, fine, fine. But at the end of the day, it's. It's the good old elliptic equation estimates that, that make things work, which you don't sort of see in talks. Uh, and so this, this is the, that key obliqueness estimate. And it's quite interesting. You, you take the, the obliqueness is measured by this kind of, in a, in a, an inner product of the, of, the, of the normal on your initial domain and the, and the, and the, and the normal of the, of the image point on your other domain. And you can think of this, this matrix C very much, you can think of it as a metric in a way. It, it, it's a pseudo-metric by the uh, condition on the determinant. So, um, uh, so it's this inner product has to be uh, controlled. Um, that's a very delicate estimate, uh, that one. Um, from there on, it's kind of standard Monge Ampere type theory that that condition of being regular enables you to get a global second derivative estimate. Uh, and then if you take account of the second boundary value problem, you can then extend that up to a full, a full estimate. So those arguments are kind of there already in the, in the, in the Monge Ampere case. Uh, what about the interior estimates? Again, there's, this is actually quite a, not a bad estimate. It's not, that A3 condition is extremely strong. And you get these uh, interior estimates, which you don't actually have in the Monge Ampere case. So you need some boundary condition as well. Uh, and then. In the, for the Lopaire results, the, the important thing, again, is an estimate for the C1 alpha estimate for the potentials. That's proved by a, a perturbation argument. It's, so for the second derivatives, you have to differentiate the equation twice and bash away with a lot of calculations. This one are kind of sneaky. You can do it just by perturbation. Uh, it's quite quick. 
it uses, it uses that condition A3, those conditions in a kind of geometric form. Okay, let me just finish. You can ask this question, what is, what is the um, relation between this C convexity property and <coughs> ellipticity? So um, it's another question raised by Cedric Bellani in his book. Uh, when do, when you, if you have an, something that's elliptic, you have the local C convexity condition, when does it imply the global one? And we, we need that, uh, or some version of that in these, these results as well. So here's a couple of conditions. They're, they're extensions of the usual result that a locally convex function on a convex domain is, is globally convex. So how does that extend in this situation? And so, so either of these conditions, I write the C minus convex we can, uh, here. How, how does that extend? And two, two possibilities. One is that the target, the image under T is C star convex, and T is one to one. Okay, so you know that if you have a, a, uh, a gradient mapping, and it's one to one, and the target is, is convex, then certainly it's going to be globally convex, just come backwards, which on the transform. Uh, and the other condition is the interesting one. This is where A3 comes in. That if your cost function satisfies A3W, and the domain is uh, C convex, then uh, your uh, function will be globally C convex. The local will imply the global property. And what we've since found, and, and, and others have also contributed to this work, uh, is that there's a whole, th the, this whole theory of C convex functions now paralleling the theory of convex functions, provided the cost that these functions of the two vectors satisfies this condition A3W. That's a sharp theory as well. So this, is, this, this A3W is a very natural condition for a convexity theory to, to, to sort of parallel the usual uh, convexity theory. In fact, all the usual things happen. Under that condition, the, if you have a support, a support uh, function, then the contact set will be a C convex set that a local support will be a global support. All the standard properties of convexity will follow under this condition. And this condition is sharp for those properties to follow. And not only that, but that is actually equivalent to having regularity as well. So there's a, there's, there is a sort of complete uh, theory. And uh, let me finish by mentioning this, this interesting geometric interpretation just found by uh, Robert McCann and, 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 a, and a student that if you, um, if you take the, the product of, a, of two manifolds, so everything I wrote can be written in manifolds, that's no problem, all conditions were invariant. Issue is, what does it mean? <laughs> uh, sure, I can write conditions by pulling back to you know, Euclidean space and they're invariant, fine. Uh, what, is it, what does it mean? And what they showed was that um, for product manifold, and I build up, I build up a pseudometric by taking a block, put the zeros in the, uh, in the, on the diagonal, and I put the matrix CXY in one block and then the, the CYX in the other, which are negative signs. So I define a pseudometric on the product, I can define a pseudometric on the product manifold this way, then my condition is, is, uh, is simply, is exactly non-negative or positive sectional curvatures, curvatures with respect to that pseudometric. So they, they found this, but we get to, to know if that actually helps with um, explicit or specific results on, on manifolds, more understanding of the relation between sectional curvature and quadratic uh, cost functions, etc. Okay, I mean, I, uh, I think because there was a, I realized that there's quite a general audience here and, 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 uh, and I, 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 I sort of wrote a talk which was more for a, um, you know, a normal mathematics uh, colloquium, but so I didn't touch applications, but there, there are a lot of, even, even these results have their applications, but the whole subject of optimal transportation <coughs> is just full of applications at the moment, uh, everywhere astronomy, uh, uh, blood flow, uh, they're everywhere. The old ones were sort of in economics and materials to mines, but the applications are absolutely enormous at, at, the, at the moment. And uh, I'm told that even this cost function square root of one plus x minus y squared is useful in meteorology. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, yes, they. Um, this this is a, this is. Um, uh, there's a big paper in Monthly Notices of the Royal Astronomical Society a few years ago. It's by um, a team largely at Nice, uh, and they um, modelled the universe by a um, mass trans by using mass transportation, and then most of it. This paper is numerics, and they want to sort of predict the age of the universe by going backwards with this transport. Yes, the um, way back. Uh, Monge. So, Monge is the kind of uh, degenerate case of what I was talking about. Uh, where are we? Yeah, so that's the general problem. And then the Monge case is the, is the special case where you have this distance. And from the point of view of this talk, that is not a good cost. First of all, it's a non-smooth function, and it's a, it's a degenerate uh, convex function as well. So it's, it's not a nice cost for me. And you, and you don't have regularity or uniqueness in this case. Uh, yeah, um, where are we? Uh, there we are, the book by Villani. So. Ah, that's all right. Sorry, the. Yes. C1 alpha again. Yes. We don't know the optimal alpha. Sorry? We don't know the optimal alpha, but if the, if the densities are bound, are just L infinity, and the uh, well, the, the F L infinity, and then the, in, the the reciprocal of the G. Just think of the F because you'd put the G aside, then just call it one. Uh, then um, if it's L infinity, then it's C one alpha again. But you can't get alpha to be one. They don't know the best alpha. We have a student who made a better alpha. But we don't know if it's a sharp one. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments? Okay, let's thank again. Let's